test, test. Good morning, everyone. Good everyone, and uh, welcome to the Inclusive Finance Pavilion. For everyone here and all of our fans all around the world who are watching on live stream, uh, good morning. Thank you for coming to, uh, to this session on governance and finance, two sides of the same coin. And um, what we would like to do here just to start, as I'll say briefly, by the way, my name is Seth Seamus. I'm the uh, Director for Policy and Markets at Eco Agriculture Partners. And I'd like to thank Solidary Dodd for organizing this session, for Katie for organizing. Um, we're hoping in this session to give you a, a lot of interesting nuggets to chew on at the intersection of governance and finance. Essentially, what are um, good conditions within governance, what's necessary for investment to come in in a productive way. Uh, and we have a really wonderful group of, of panelists to give their experiences on what they think um, these appropriate conditions are, who, uh, how actors can work together in order to meet these conditions uh, within landscapes. And um, I'll start by defining terms just a little bit because each of these terms, landscape, governance, and finance are all um, ideas that I think many books and papers have been written on. And, and when you put them all together, it's kind of even that much more of a comp complex, uh, questionable, what does this actually mean? So um, I will tell you that we will not get to some consensus answer on what this all means now, but we will merely have opportunities for food for thought. But I will make one advertisement for one definition of landscape governance. And I see one our colleague here, uh, Marchi from Tropenbos, who did a, a wonderful job on a, uh, a publication that lays out performance criteria for, uh, for landscape governance. So I will read for you what we consider to be landscape governance, which is a, a broad definition which we'll use throughout the course of this session. So. We have landscape governance is defined as a set of rules, policies, or cultural norms. So not just the formal rules, but informal rules uh, as well. And, and the processes of decision making among a variety of stakeholders, so public, private, and civic, with stakes in the landscape that affect actions in the landscape. So that definition also helps define what we mean by landscape, which is groups of stakeholders 
with an interest in a particular place working together um, in order to meet common objectives. So of course, any group of stakeholders operating that way in a landscape uh, need a, systems of governance that, they, that are effective and they can agree on, and ultimately there will be financing coming in for their activities that will overlay on those systems of governance. So our esteemed panel is going to tell us how this can be done effectively and appropriately. So let me start by kind of introducing everyone um, and we'll have a first round of, of comments where they can introduce their work. Um, so I'll, I guess we'll start going this way with, with Christian. Um, Christian Schultz worked as a natural resource management officer for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and coordinated the implementation of the voluntary guidelines of responsible governance of tenure in Sierra Leone and Liberia from November 14th through November, uh, <clears throat> November 2014 through November 2017. We have Duncan, Duncan Gromko, who works on the finance and business side of sustainable land issues at Unique Forestry and Land Use. He manages Unique's Climate Smart Business Agribusiness Investment Accelerator. Prior to starting with Unique, Duncan developed projects for a Climate Smart Agriculture Fund part of the Inter-American Development Bank's private sector operations. Then um, we have Julian Kwan, land tenure and governance specialist at Natural Resource Institute, University of Greenwich, who coordinates the DFID-funded LEGEND program, which focuses on promoting responsible land governance surrounding agricultural investments and contributing to more effective land policies, interventions, and governance solutions globally. And finally, we have Lenny Martinez, who works as an asset manager with 12 Tree. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's much better. Yeah. That's, that's, well, congratulations to the person who came up with that one. That's good. Okay, for forestry and agroforestry projects with a focus on Central and South America, the focus of One, Two, Tree is to combine solid profitability for institutional investors with strong environmental and social impacts. So it's really, um, we, have, we have really a lot of kind of deep resource here, <coughs> deep knowledge here. Unfortunately, the session will only be 45 minutes. So the way that we will structure this is we're gonna have a round of, of, of introductions uh, for kind of key themes for everyone, and then I will ask a question for everyone on the panel, and we'll do another round. And then as soon as we can, we would, at, we would like to open this up to discussion from the audience, because we know as, as deep as the knowledge here is on the panel, there's very deep knowledge in the audience. So you to ask questions and make comments on, on what you've heard here. So um, let's start, maybe Christian, let me start with you. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Christian Schulze. As uh, Seth introduced uh, me, I worked the last three years uh, for FAO on the implementation of the voluntary guidelines under responsible governance of tenure, particularly in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, I'm since two weeks no longer with FAO anymore, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization uh, at this point. Um, I'm very happy to be here, to be part of this panel, because uh, I think that um, governance of land is uh, something we often overlook when we talk about um, finance in, in land use sectors. And in many uh, countries, um, you still find weak land governance uh, structures um, caused by lack of funding, insufficient human, and, um, human resource capacity, and uh, lack of political will, maybe. But um, why this is important is that all these administrative dysfunctionalities that you can have out of that, like a um, lack of a functioning land administ uh, administration system and so forth, creates a lot of uncertainties and risks for uh, investors that want to invest in, in a certain landscape. And uh, now looking back at my um, experience in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, that um, led to certain phenomena that you would have on the one side investors that um, would not adhere to certain best practice standards um, that are there and uh, would would do it their own way, let's say. Um, 
And on the other hand, you might have investors that would like to do uh, investor in a proper way, but are basically left alone because there's no uh, guidance, uh, no regulation, and, and not much support from uh, government side on how to go about certain things. Um, that uh, makes managing of expectations from all sides a huge problem and uh, makes it very difficult to understand the roles, <coughs> roles and responsibilities certain actors have in the whole uh, investment process. So the challenge, I think, and the issues I would like to discuss with the panelists and you is um, how can we improve uh, the enabling environment, the governance environment um, for finance? Um, how to build these adequate uh, human and financial capacities that you need for proper implementation? And uh, how to uh, um, yeah, create this inclusive dialogue um, that you would also need to to have investors to be to be um, to have investors to be part of the debate and to understand why governance issues are important for them and why they are important to uh, to manage certain risks and then um, in that debate I would like to uh, bring in some examples from Sierra Leone how how Sierra Leone is going about that uh, by using the voluntary guidelines um, as minimum standard and as tools to create a better enabling environment. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Duncan Gramko. Uh, I work for Unique Forestry and Land Use. We're a German-based German consulting company. Um, before Unique, I was working at the, as, as Seth mentioned, I was working at the Inter-American Development Bank, where I was managing a climate-smart agriculture investment fund, where we were investing in small um, agriculture and forestry enterprises. Uh, now working with Unique, I'm working on very similar topics, but at a slightly different perspective. Um, we're advising both for, for businesses that are trying to access investment and for investors that would like to invest into interesting um, agriculture and forestry projects around the world. Um, and one, one, one word that I heard from Christian really resonated with me, which was he was talking about uncertainty. And I would use a very similar concept, but maybe uh, a slightly different word, which is risk. Um, and both when I was at the, the IDB and now at Unique, when we're working with investors that are trying to put money into projects, what they're concerned about is risk. Um, we're talking about the, the businesses that I'm working with are small, smallish businesses. Um, these are sectors, agriculture, forestry, that are generally considered risky. And the countries that we're working in, um, I'm working a lot in East Africa and in South America. These are countries with um, a lot of uncertainty, political risk. So all, all of these, these factors make investors um, concerned about putting their money into a project because they see risk. Um, and so for me, what, how this relates to the topic of the session is good governance can be really important to reduce risk for investors and to facilitate um, investment, private investment coming into um, projects that I think climate smart agriculture, climate smart forestry projects that I think are really important. Um, so that's just it for an introduction, but yeah, I'll get into more and how we can reduce risks, um, how governance can reduce risks and which type of governance are most important. Thanks. Hi, morning everybody. Uh, Julian Quant from the DFID Legend program. That's land enhancing governance for economic development. Uh, we try to work in the space between land governance and agricultural investment. And that's a space in which there are quite serious gaps in terms of decision making and programming, both at global level in terms of how investment decisions are made for how you support good land governance or how you make good responsible financial investments. And also, I think, as has just been illustrated, serious gaps which investors face on the ground. So the financial business risk to investors in trying to get a sustainable return. Uh, and the risks to livelihoods and to secure land rights and to food security on the ground are also two sides of the same coin. Now, th this is a gap. These gaps are ones which Legend is trying to fill in a number of ways uh, through analytical work on quantifying tenure risk for investors, on uh, the screening and due diligence practices of development finance uh, institutes and how they can leverage better investment. Um, we're supporting the development of guidance and platforms for dialogue by a number of partners, notably RRI and the Interlaken Group, 
who you might have heard about, um, who are trying to promote dialogue at global level, but also trying to bring that down to country level. And we're also piloting a number of supposedly innovative initiatives, partnerships between civil society agencies and businesses uh, at local level in sub-Saharan Africa in five countries which are trying to create situations to show how there's a route to sustainable returns for businesses while protecting land rights. Now, one of the issues that these pilots and this country experience raises is that as well as a kind of general land governance gap in, in finance and planning, there's a serious landscape governance gap on the ground. And that is because, really, it, it's not enough to treat investments on a case-by-case -case basis, to do lots of du due diligence, ESIAs, etc., highly expensive. When you have investments operating in context, there are multiple investments, uh, multiple supply chains intersect on the ground. There are multiple factors driving land use change, demographic change, logging, uh, agricultural investment of different kinds, etc., etc. And so there's a need to take a broader landscape-based or let's say a jurisdictional approach that looks at the whole district, the whole province, how, how the dynamics of these things are working. But part of this gap is also you know, a serious gap in capacity to understand, recognize, and document land rights, uh, the technical capacity for land use planning, and the capacity to bring stakeholders together uh, to organize. So community organizations, farmers' organizations, investors, local government, and indeed the partners who are driving these changes who are investing in them. So there's a real weakness in terms of institutional arrangements. So that's really the pitch to say, actually, we need to look at the financial mechanisms that we have to see how we can better strengthen governance on the ground. So that is landscape level, territorial planning, but also the documentation and the mapping of land rights. And so we need to look, we need to look at jurisdictions, we need to look at how decisions are made across different levels, and we need to focus on strengthening mechanisms to bring stakeholders together and to bring appropriate finance in to the landscape level, which means working more closely with local government and the other stakeholders. So thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Lenny Martinez. I come from France and uh, Spain, but I live quite a while from in, in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, I worked before for, for Action Contra, Action Contra el Hambre, the um, uh, German foundation uh, about social issues in, uh, here in, in Germany. Um, now I work as a sustainability officer for 123, which is an um, investment um, company. We invest in agroforestry projects in South America. Uh, we invest in Panama um, in a project with cocoa um, uh, trees. And uh, we are looking for projects um, in different countries in South America. As we received a mandate from a German pension fund, uh, we have 200 million to invest in projects, either in uh, brownfield projects or uh, greenfield projects. So I'm uh, not an asset manager. I'm a sustainability officer, so I look at the plantation in a way that we... We need to improve our, our social and uh, environmental impact in the plantation. So for us, it, when we talk about a good governance, for us, it's um, pay our workers better than the minimum in the region, provide trainings to, um, to the workers, but also to the, to the community close to the plantation, and provide welfare um, facilities to, the, to, the, to our workers and um, and yeah, to have a, try to have a good impact in the region and try to, to, to improve the quality of the soil because we, we work in plantation where we, we, we don't find we, we do find and we don't find any trees. So we, we, we try to, to, to improve the, the, the soil and, and to have a positive impact in the region. In the region. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so as we get a bit deeper into your experiences, um, I, will, I will bring in, I think, a word that I heard a number of you use, which again is one that can be used in different ways, and that's the word risk. Um, we often have in conversations around sort of finance and conservation, there are a lot of jokes people make about how, peop how we speak past each other. So for example, the word equity you could be having a conversation with someone and half an hour goes by and you realize that someone's using the word equity to, con to mean the ownership stake in a company and the other person's using equity to mean essentially equality. And in this context of governance and finance, it seems like risk is a good, uh, is a good word and, and Julian said it directly. I mean, there's risk 
for the investor. And so there's ways that good governance can impact, uh, can lower risk for an investor. But then, of course, there is also risk for people who live there and the risk to livelihood if investment is done in a way, uh, it done someplace where, let's say, there's poor governance. So maybe I'll just ask this qu question this way and consider it open-ended. Um, in your experiences, whether you're an investor or running a program, what are the ways that you see that this risk can be reduced? If that risk means for the people living within the landscape and or the risk for the investor, which in some cases, you know, ideally if you have good, good governance, that would be the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Seth. Um, yeah, I think the, it's an essential question. I think, um, as, you, as you laid it out, the risks go, go in both ways. And now from an invector, investor perspective, I think um, what you have to understand before you do the investment is your, the, the context, basically, that you're operating in. And um, especially in the area of land rights, I think there are still gaps that uh, in terms of the preliminary assessment, the due diligence, the consultation, uh, the negotiations and uh, the agreements at the end of the day. So at the beginning of the investment, I think that's where in regarding tenure and, and, and the land issues, uh, most of the mistakes are still made. And I think uh, if you operate in an area with a weak governance environment, meaning unclear legislation, uh, lack of enforcement, corruption maybe, um, it is highly likely that if you don't go through all these st steps in a proper way with free prior informed consent, with uh, uh, the, the amount needed to consult with, with uh, um, legitimate uh, tenure holders, that you will increase risks for your investments. And that can, that can be financial risks because you maybe have to compensate at a later stage or you have delays because uh, communities are uh, um, uh, yeah, delaying certain processes, but it can also lead to uh, reputational risks at the end of the day if, um, if uh, that leads into a d dispute or conflict uh, and so forth. So I think um, for an investor, this screening process at the beginning is, is very key, and I think there are existing tools out there that investors can use. I mean, again, if I bring it back to the voluntary guidelines, um, FAO has developed technical guides over the last years, and there is um, it's a series of technical guides for different target groups on different topics, but there's a specific one for investors that can be used as a kind of uh, checklist, uh, so to speak, uh, where all these different steps are, are, are laid out, and you can basically tick the boxes, and then you can see, okay, in the area I want to operate, ABC is, looks critical, so I should maybe reconsider or, or not go ahead with an investment at, uh, at um, worst, in the worst case, let's say. Yeah, thanks. Um, so on, on Seth's point about the, the word risk, I, uh, w just to be clear, what, when, I, when I was talking about risk, I was talking about financial risk and risk to investors. Um, but I, I do take your point very well that there are a lot of risks to the local community, to local people um, from an investment. And I think that um, the, the best, in some cases, the interests of the investor and, you know, say the community or local population are aligned. And this is the ideal situation where there's a kind of win-win. Um, but a, a lot of times as well, there's a, there's a conflict of interests and a conflict between local people and the investor. And I think that a good governance system at a maybe at a country level tries to align those interests as well as you can so that um, there isn't to, to try to reduce this conflict or to mit mitigate the the conflict um, when when I was asked to be on the panel I talked to colleagues a lot about what what is what is governance what is landscape governance and I think Seth is um, talked, uh, read a definition which I find very helpful. Um, for me, as, you know, thinking in, in terms of how investors um, think of uh, assessing a project, for me, there are a couple of types of governance that I think are, are really important, and I want to go through them, um, and I'd be curious to hear feedback about how you think of this in terms of the definition of governance. So first, I think 
Corporate governance is extremely important to investors. So corporate governance means how does a business take decisions? What is their management structure? What is their decision-making process? How, um, how inclusive are they in the decision-making process? How transparent are they? Um, and I'll just uh, make one very clear example. We're working with a company in Kenya um, that we're trying to help uh, access investment. And for them, the, tr the challenge really is transparency, um, and especially to do with their financial statements, that they haven't been reporting all of their revenues on their financial statements. They're, they're a re relatively small business. It's not anything, um, they're not acting in a, in a, with a bad intent, but it's just kind of bad accounting practices. But from an investor perspective, this is a, what I was talking about before. This is a huge risk because you don't, the, the company doesn't have good corporate governance. They are not being transparent about their, their financial statements. So the investor says, I, I don't know what I'm investing in. So this is one kind of governance, corporate governance, I think is very important for an investor. Um, a second kind is, I'd say, kind of policy or, or political governance. Um, this, this can be a range of things. So what are policies about foreign exchange? What are policy, there, there, in many countries there are policies uh, limiting or restricting foreign investors to invest. Um, and then I think what we're talking a lot here about is, is about what are in environmental regulations that would affect investment. Um, so es especially how, how is a country controlling deforestation or other environmental negative outcomes of investment. And this gets back to, a, again, what I'm talking about risk is I think that um, uh, especially impact investors, but investors in general don't want to be associated with uh, trees being cut down with a, a, a big negative headline story. So there's, there's reputational risk to investors. And as much as there is good governance in a country, it makes it, it, re it really reduces this reputational risk. So for example, um, I was working before with talking to a, a uh, multilateral development bank that's really interested to invest in, in Paraguay in agriculture and forestry projects there. But for them, the trouble is that there's poor control of deforestation in Paraguay and there's bad enforcement, um, bad's maybe, I don't want to use the word, but not great enforcement of, of um, deforestation laws in, in Paraguay. And so if you're investing in the country in, in agriculture and forestry sectors, you you have a very high risk of being associated with deforestation. So uh, in this way, I think political governance, what are the, the policies in place in the country and how well are they implemented really affects an, an investor risk. Um, I'll just, yeah, I have some more thoughts on this, but I'll leave that there for now. I'd like to illustrate this question of risk with reference to a, a concrete landscape example in Mozambique. Central Mozambique, uh, where a large-scale concession for plantation forestry, eucalyptus, was allocated by central government uh, to the company Porticel, uh, IFC, uh, International Finance Corporation, has a significant interest in this because there was a project to develop a pulp and paper mill in the long term. Um, so a very serious investment that um, Mozambique government was very interested in getting the revenue from as well. And so you have this top-down allocation of a very, very large-scale concession of over 100,000 hectares in, in, in several different blocks in an area that's actually highly densely populated in a very productive uh, agricultural area, basically under customary management. And so you had quite a serious problem from the beginning here. Now, one of the good things IFC did was promote a very, very small pilot in one community just to see how this was working. And local land rights organizations uh, and some small-scale partners, technical partners based in Maputo, uh, picked this up and took this project to legend uh, for larger-scale funding. Now, this is really quite interesting in terms of what is happening on the ground because Portucel essentially were trying to assemble land for large-scale plantation blocks, and they realized very, very quickly that they couldn't do that. Uh, they were starting to consult with chiefs uh, and offer, you know, uh, offer incentives to chiefs, offer incentives to community, to community to say, hey, release the land, and a certain amount of land got released. Um, but that led to problems very, very quickly because the land rights were completely undocumented. So one of the things that Legend's doing uh, through our civil society partners is developing a system for 
technology-based system for, for documenting land rights, both at community level and household level. And one of the things that really shows is that the community level documentation uh, to, like, delimit the land rights and identify what communities, what local authorities are responsible is a critical thing to do uh, in order to empower those communities to raise awareness, to give them the opportunity to say yes or no. And that simply wasn't being done. So now we're trying to do this at a much, much larger scale. Uh, what's beginning to happen now is that Porticell have recognized that they have to shift their business model. Uh, the plans, the infrastructure are not in place for the long-term pulp and paper mill now, so they're going to focus on wood chips and poles for the local market. So far, so good, but they're still trying to build that up gradually. And as we build community uh, capacity, as we document land rights and raise people's legal awareness, uh, and this goes around down to producing certificates. So under the law, under the national system, an innovative arrangement to actually generate the land use, uh, the, the, land, the land titles, if you like, on a family basis uh, and the rights on a community basis at local level. Now, this can be done. And once those, that capacity is in place, communities are in a position to negotiate with Porticell. Porticell can offer outgrower schemes, can develop small-scale woodlots, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still very much a moving target. And the outcomes are really a, a little uncertain. I mean, there are quite serious challenges here for finance. I mean, certainly the investment really wasn't properly screened properly. There should have been much better knowledge about how land holding and local authority uh, over land works. Uh, the outreach done by the company, which was essentially leaning on people, persuading them, offering them incentives, bribing them, finding any way to assemble the land, because it was driven by a business target, really had to change. And so there's a real need here for um, companies to have access to independent knowledge and expertise uh, to give them information on the ground. So you need civil society in there, you need finance for the civil society role, but the civil society role has to be independent in order to retain the confidence of communities. So there are a number of things that are really quite, quite tricky here. Um, our project, you know, it runs for two, two and a half years. It will take it up to a certain level. Hopefully, uh, Porticell will get on track of a sustainable, more sustainable, smaller scale business model in this process. But you know, the process needs to be scaled up. It needs to be sustained. Finance is needed to, to register the land rights at a much, much greater scale, to build community awareness and to build local community institutions that can work with government and that can negotiate with investors. Uh, finance is needed really to enable companies to access civil society expertise and to build that civil society expertise to be able to work hand in hand, not only with companies, but particularly at community level and to bring stakeholders together. So, and also very clearly, you know, this was eucalyptus. This is in an environment where most of the indigenous forest has now disappeared, but not quite all of it, where people are, it's a really productive area for food production. You can't eat eucalyptus. Uh, but, I mean, it can provide useful sources of income, supplementary income for communities. But there's a lot of diversification that could be done. So questions really raised about the type of investment project, the type of capital, the rate of return that's being sought. You know, you really need more social, cap more social enterprise capital here. You need patient capital. Um, Large-scale investment has a role, but you need a, a little flexibility in terms of the business model. And so the rate of return is perhaps not going to be what it was, but on the other hand, if we can construct the right kind of financial instruments and screen investments in the right way and create the right governance arrangements on the ground and document the land rights, then there's every possibility of a, a gradual, slower return to a whole range of types of investments which bring communities with them and which do offer returns to capital in the long run. But we need, a, let's say, a more nuanced, more subtle approach. And we need to, we need to bring the, the top level decision making on investment planning down to the ground. And we need to link it to knowledge and understanding of local conditions. We need to bring local government into the picture. We need to build community capacity. And we need governance instruments and essentially finance instruments to support that kind of process. Thank you. So for us, it's very important to understand what the local community uh, expects for us and what the national entity also expects from us when we, um, when we invest in a project in, in, in South America. So we, we try to work as much as possible with, with uh, local communities um, transforming um, locally the, the raw materials. So we, 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 we try to, 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 found, to, to create a biomass plant in Colombia, for example, and we work with uh, the national government to, 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 
to, to, to build this uh, biomass plant with uh, our species. We have we plant acacia manjum in Colombia, so we try to transform locally the the, the, the the raw materials. So for us, it's very important to to, to understand what what they need from us, um, and obviously we do um, impact assessment, social impact assessment at, from the beginning, and yeah. Thank you all very much. So we have a, a few minutes left, uh, and I would invite um, audience comments or questions to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much to the, all of you for the very interesting presentation. Um, as far as governance, in my opinion, good governance is a democratic governance, one person, one vote. Uh, that's the only way I can call it a good governance. About risk, uh, we need good business cases. That way we can manage risk. So I, I keep on hearing people talking about how risky the forestry sector is or the agriculture sector because we don't have good business cases. About reputational risk, that's my favorite. Um, I hope investors take the social and environmental dimension into account for the sole exclusive reason of being sustainable, not for their own reputation. Reputation is not a dimension of sustainability. I hope I misunderstood what you mean with reputational risk. And I'm sure that you incorporate social and environmental issues only for that reason, not for reputation. Reputation is not sustainable. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Francesca Nunez. I'm an economist. I work in f access to finance for sustainable forestry, sustainable agriculture, and smallholders in sustainable in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we'll take two more comments and questions and then bring it back to the panel. So I think I saw a question here first. Yeah, and also introduce yourself first. Um, well, good morning. My name is Thorsten Klimpel. I work for the Tropical Forest Foundation Oro Verde. Thank you very much for the panelists. It was very interesting to, to listen to you. First, what do you think about using public money to, as a first loss risk investment to reduce the risk for the investor or the, the investment funds? Uh, do you think it's a, it's a good thing to use the risk or is it more like... Um, socializing the, the losses and privatizing the gains. And um, then already Francesca mentioned, um, do you think this environmental return and the social return, when you're investing in, in landscape, is it taken into account? Is it monitorized? Um, for example, investing in, in sustainable agroforestry system have some risk reduction due to climate change. Is it in the mind of the investor or is it an important subject at the moment. And one specific question to you, Lenny, um, what's the return expectation of this pension funds investing in, in this area? Are they very low or do they really need this high return as a traditional investor? Thank you. Okay, was there anyone else? Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for a very interesting uh, discussion. So I'm Eric Patrick with in, uh, International Fund for Agricultural Development. Um, so, okay, I'm thinking of the Mozambique case that was given, but let's forget about Mozambique, just a sort of more general question. I mean, I'm wondering if we're being realistic in terms of the political economy, because, I mean, the reality is that, in, you know, in, in the vast majority of countries, um, you know, people that are in a in a gatekeeper position, we use that to, for rent seeking, right? So if everything suddenly becomes, you know, a formal rule based, there's huge, huge opportunity costs from their private perspective. So do we have cases where, you know, you have basically the background, what do you call it? I don't know if you call it the political risk, um, you know, is, is, is basically one of of you know, unfair competition, you know, uneven access to resources based on connection, et cetera. And then within such a context, realistically, to create a subset uh, where you have this nice governance environment, is that a one-off investment in, in e intermediation costs, which is 
unsustainable? Because and so, where are the, what's the scope for this? Uh, you know that because a lot of these things, the the changes are generational, but the you know the requirements are quite specific and are time bound in terms of uh, an investor perspective on a return. Thank you. All right, so um, this is the choo choose your own adventure <coughs> questions. We can we can we can start. Maybe just go down the line and respond to the question that you question or questions that that you are most interested in. Yes. <coughs> okay. I will I will go first and pick a few of the questions. Um, first of all, I from from personal perspective. Now, I also think that. Um, when <clears throat> when you do the screening, uh, the adherence to the social and environmental risks that can occur through an investment should be enough, actually, to make a decision if you continue with an investment or not. However, from my experience um, when looking at in investments, I think what we call reputational risk cannot be overlooked, that it plays a huge role, and uh, for the investor, how the investor will go about uh, the, the actual case. I think that's that's a reality that uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, what I would like to address a bit further was the the last question on the political economy from a from a governance perspective, because I think the the point is very valid and it's uh, it can be seen in many cases. And when I now look back at uh, uh, the time in Sierra Leone. Um, you also have situations like that where uh, an individual or, or groups benefit from the status quo, from the weak governance that is in place. So how do you um, yeah, give incentives and, 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 and uh, introduce change um, uh, in, in this area? So I think one uh, best practice that we found there was this... Um, inclusive dialogue that you brought in or that you opened up actually a dialogue an arena for debate through these multi-stakeholder platforms that were not there before. So suddenly you have uh, a regular forum where people can address certain issues. <clears throat> so people cannot hide um, from them anymore. It's in the public domain and you, you continue to working on them. It's a very long process so it's, it's nothing that, that will change overnight. But just to give you an example, what uh, the outcomes of this process are up to date, and it started in February 2014. There was no comprehensive land policy before in Sierra Leone. Now, since last year, there is one that um, makes over 90 direct references to either the African Union land policy framework and guidelines or the voluntary guidelines. So um, it's considered to be quite good policy for the context. Um, now, again, you have the question, okay, how do you implement the policy? I mean, bringing something on paper is one thing and forcing it is, is the other. Um, but also that process of having the policy now led to a review of the investment approval process for agricultural investments because people felt that one uh, cause of certain bad cases was that the investment approval process does not adhere to certain best practice standards. So they used the policy and the guidelines and um, went step by step through the investment approval process, reviewed it and validated it in this multi-stakeholder platform. You also have districts, we, we um, Julian mentioned jurisdictions, looking at the landscapes. You have certain districts that integrated voluntary guidelines principles in the annual district plans. Uh, when, or even uh, one district uh, used the voluntary guidelines to develop own agricultural investment guidelines for that district. So you can see different examples how the introduction of this best practice standard uh, broken down to the country context uh, and discussed in the multi-stakeholder way can maybe overcome certain singular or individual interests and of course it is easier to tackle them in this multi-stakeholder way than if you probably would do that um, uh, on an individual level. I think I will leave the other questions for you. Yeah, thanks for the very interesting questions, and uh, p apologies if we can't get to them all. I think they probably deserve a lot more time than we have left, um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone if you want to follow up after. Um, on the, I'll go in reverse order. On um, the rent seeking, especially the, the question of one-off investment in um, a good uh, investment climate, I think that there are cases where 
um, businesses inve or, sorry, where investors are pushing businesses to improve their environmental and social policies. Um, and, and this is very positive because these companies can be leaders in their company in their country and kind of transform the sector. However, I think, like you said, the transaction costs of that are, are extremely high, and um, it's not really uh, it's not going to achieve a, a transformation. This, this this kind of investment climate needs to be improved at the country level, not um, case by case. Um, the question on uh, public money for first loss guarantee uh, or risk, risk absorption, I guess. Um, yes, in general, I think this is a, a, a good use of public money. This is my opinion. I think that we should be encouraging investments that have positive social and environmental returns and that using public money is, is uh, a reasonable way to do that. There are there's this concern about using public money to, to sorry, socializing risk and privatizing profit or however you put it. Um, there's uh, the, the development finance institutions, the multilateral development banks are, have formulated a concept called minimum concessionality, which is quite uh, complicated, but basically is a principle of uh, minimizing the subsidy for the private sector. So it's at the lowest level that the private sector would still in invest. So I think this is one, it, there's, it still needs to be developed better, but it is one way to ensure that the private gains are not sort of above market or uh, what the, the company, the investor would get in, in the commercial market. And then the last question is from Francesca. Um, so first on the one person, one vote, um, I, I mean, I agree at a country level, I would only say that I think it matters what level, what uh, kind of institution or organization you're talking about. Like I was talking about corporate governance before, and my opinion is that uh, democratic decision making at a big company doesn't make sense. Like I don't think that every employee at a company, I, I don't know, I, for every decision, I think it's difficult to do. So I just would say that um, it depends on the institution, is my opinion, um, when, how democratic. I, I'm, I'm pro-democracy, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, like at a corporate cover, at a, at a company level, I think it's difficult to have one, one, one person, one vote. Um, and then the, the last point I, which I want to address is your question on reputational risk versus, I guess, if I understood correctly, social and environmental objectives. Um, uh, I, what I was describing was the way that I see the situation, not how I think it should be. So I see, I perceive that most investors are concerned with reputational risk over social and environmental objectives. Um, I wish it was another way. I think there are impact investors who have social and environmental uh, objectives that they want to achieve with their, their investments. But I do think that this is an exception and that for most investors, reputational risk is the primary uh, primary environmental social concern. So just not what I want it to be, how I perceive it to be. Thanks. Okay, just to follow that up, that reputational risk is also quite closely related to financial risk when reputations become so bad and conflict on the ground is difficult. So let me try and respond briefly to these really challenging questions about the best use of public money and, uh, and political economy. I mean, I think, yes, first loss risk guarantees from public money. This is all very well, but if the objectives are essentially financial, commercial, and not social and environmental, I think there's a need for a lot more scrutiny and a lot more uh, awareness of the political economy context and a lot of un better understanding of the dynamics on the ground. And, and I think the Porticell case in, in Mozambique illustrates that. I mean, the world's had the IMF, the world's had its eyes open to the corruption problems uh, in Mozambique very much in the last couple of years. But we're still in the position of finding a way to, to remediate and to intermediate between companies, investors, and communities and other stakeholders on the ground to try to mop up the kind of legacy problems that have been created by quite a large number of, of failed investments in countries like Mozambique and Sierra Leone. Yet there's still a need for investment to come into communities and to come into the local economy. So on the one hand, you know, you could postulate that ideally you should have a landscape governance 
situation which was quite closely tied to the jurisdictional authorities of district, provincial government, and you move towards some kind of deliberative democracy where you bring in stakeholders, you build community capacity, and you take informed decisions. Now, that might be an ideal scenario, but the political economy of many countries is simply not like that. And so there's a need to work with what you have. But I think you know, there are ways in. There's a way in in a context like Mozambique. It does involve putting public finance into the costs of community engagement on the ground, into the costs of documenting land rights and building community institutions. And what I would say is that those governance arrangements at that level and strengthening the capacity at local provincial government level to do land use planning and to engage with stakeholders around the, you know, the different interests, commercial, environmental, in a landscape is absolutely critical. And that should really be the first call on public money. When that's there, I don't think there's any problem in public money assisting sustainable investments. But that's the level at which policies in international finance institutions and also government policies, lending policies, aid policies in terms of how they treat the private sector and where they're going to invest uh, strategically need to be better informed by analysis on the ground and need to connect better with government, with local government and with stakeholders who are informed about the, the, the dynamics on the ground. So there's a need to go to work hand in hand and not to take high level finance decisions uh, which look good but when you hit the ground, end up in conflict and quite serious remediation costs, which can last for generations. So now's the time to try to reinvent, if you like, the decision-making processes, the finance instruments, and come together and build some capacity for sustainable landscape governance. Thanks. To answer your question, we, we, invest, we are long-term investors, so we, we, we invest in two kind of projects in Brownfield project plantation and also greenfield plantation with different rentability but we expect 10 uh, percent um, um, per year yeah okay just one more yeah quickly we're because we're out of time but yeah I just want to add one thing, um, because the, um, the word transaction costs popped up here, and this is something also from my experience that especially in dialogues with investors you hear quite often, you, they would say uh, the fees for an environmental social impact assessments are too high, uh, the mapping out all the rights of, of the right holders is uh, too laborious, uh, and so on and so on. So the term transaction costs comes up all the time, but I think what investors need to understand is that getting it wrong is even more costly at the end of the day. So in, in a long-term perspective, all these steps that we are now, that we went through, I think um, will benefit them in the long run. And I think this understanding uh, leads also to the question that, that, uh, that came from the back about the social and environmental risks that are involved. I think there is a, a linkage um, and a win-win situation and that, that, I, that investors should understand, I think. Thank you. Now we require uh, knowledgeable, enlightened investors uh, to engage. So thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, and the next showing will be at 10 o'clock uh, in about uh, five minutes. And it's seven minutes. So really, we um, encourage you all to, to continue these conversations. You can just hang out around the pavilion here, get some coffee, and you know, maybe the speakers will stick around for a little while. Uh, so we thank you all very much. Well, we have this, we've recorded this, which um, will be online, I think. The recording will be online. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming. Yeah.